Right, let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Tiara Curry. I'm a senior scientist at the Center for Biological Diversity. I work in our Portland office, but now I'm working from home. We're very grateful that you were spending your time with us on these webinars. It's been fun for me and um, from the emails I've gotten from many of you, you've appreciated too the chance to get to know some of our staff and do a deeper dive on these issues. And so today we're gonna talk about grizzly bears and wolverines. And I'm excited about this because not everybody at the center gets to work on charismatic species like I do, including snails and freshwater mussels. Some people are stuck working on less glamorous wildlife like grizzly bears and wolverines. So today we get to talk to those staff. Um, first, a couple of technical things. We disabled the chat bar because we got feedback from you guys that that was very distracting. But at the end, we're gonna do questions and answers. So you can use the Q&A function to send us your questions and we'll get to as many of them as we can today. The ones that we don't get to, you can either email me or I'll be hanging out on the Slack activist channel um, under Mobilized for the Wild, the Endangered Species channel, tomorrow at noon Pacific for an hour. So hop on Slack and you'll also get an email from us with an action you can take to help save grizzly bears and wolverines and instructions on how to join the Slack activist channel if you're not on there yet. So with that, I'm gonna let Andrea Zaccardi and Noah Greenwald introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Andrea Zaccardi. I am a senior attorney with the center and I'm based in Victor, Idaho. So in the heart of the Northern Rockies, which is where most of the species that I work on including grizzly bears that I'll be talking to you today about live. And I'm Noah Greenwald. I'm the Endangered Species Director here at the Center for Biological Diversity <coughs> out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, been at the center since uh, 1997, so coming up on 23 years, and it's been a fun ride and excited to talk to all of you about wolverines today. So Noah actually hired me 13 years ago, and I worked in his basement for years before the center had an office on snail petitions, mostly. Um, so let's jump into our content for today. I really, I don't know much about grizzly bears, so I'm excited to learn this stuff. Andrea, where do grizzly bears live? Um, well, they used to live in a lot more places than they do today. Um, you know, in, in North America, in the lower 48 states, we once had scientists estimate about 50,000 grizzly bears. Um, they ranged all the way from coastal California to the Great Plains and all the way from Canada to Mexico. Um, but, you know, starting at the beginning, the 1930s and, and with settlement of European settlement in the West, um, there was a government eradication program, federally funded, and grizzly bears were shot, poisoned, trapped, um, nearly to extinction. So in 1975, when they were first placed on the Endangered Species Act list, grizzly bears were down to less than 2% of their historic range. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? So this map kind of shows you where they live today, those, um, hashed areas, black hashed areas are where they live. So they're in five isolated populations now in the lower 48 states with the biggest populations being in the greater Yellowstone area and the Northern Continental Divide, which is around Glacier National Park. And then there's a couple smaller populations in the Cabinet Yak, um, which is, you can see in, in the orange there, bordering Canada, it covers little, little land in Montana and Idaho, the Selkirks up in Northern Idaho, and the North Cascades, we think there's, you know, maybe a couple bears there, but um, they really haven't actually seen any bears there in, in quite some time. So, you know, the, the listing under the Endangered Species Act has certainly helped grizzly bears recover um, Somewhat, but I think they still have a long way to go. What's threatening grizzly bears? I'm sorry? What is threatening grizzly bears right now? 
Oh, all sorts of things. Um, you know, a lot of the mortalities to grizzly bears are caused um, their management removals, actually. If, if grizzly bears come into conflict with livestock that are grazing on public lands. Um, in the fall, uh, a, you know, one of the major causes of death is black bear hunters that kill grizzly bears, um, mistaking them for being black bears. Um, you know, and, and one of the biggest threats really is habitat loss as well. So I'll, t I'll talk to you in a little bit about some of the um, litigation and projects that we're working on to try to protect the habitat that they do have left. So I have to ask, have you ever seen a grizzly bear? I have seen many grizzly bears. Yeah, I'm very fortunate to uh, live where I do. Um, most of the grizzly bears I've seen have uh, been in Yellowstone National Park or Grand Teton National Park, which is kind of on my back doorstep. But a couple of years ago, I was actually um, hiking just a little trail that is right at the end of my road behind my house. And I was on the phone with um, a colleague, actually. I was on the phone with Amaruk and here comes a grizzly bear walking down the trail that I'm walking up. Um, I was with a, a friend that was visiting from Texas. So <laughs> told her to turn around and not run, but walk down slowly. And my dog was in between me and the bear. And um, she was so, concentrated on hunting a bull or something. She didn't even see it. So I called her and we turned around and went back down the trail. Wow, that's so cool. So what do grizzly bears eat? Um, so it depends where they are. Grizzly bears, you know, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem are, their four main food sources are um, meat or carrion, um, army cutworm moths, uh, Yellowstone cutthroat trout used to be a, a major source for them. Um, you know, but they're omnivorous, so they, they really also eat roots and shrubs and berries and, um, you know, they're pretty good at uh, eating whatever is available. The other ma major food source that we had in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem was white bark pine cones. The seeds from the cones actually provide a lot of calories for grizzly bears, so they would kind of fill up on them before denning for the winter. Um, but white bark pine is, is largely dwindling very quickly in greater Yellowstone. So are grizzly bears in the lower 48 states still protected under the Endangered Species Act? They are, thankfully. Um, there have been some, some efforts by the federal government to take them off the endangered species list. So um, specifically bears in Greater Yellowstone, um, the federal government passed a rule to remove them from the ESA the first time back in 2007. Um, that was overturned in court and they were placed back on the endangered species list. And then most recently in 2017, the federal government also um, approved a rule that uh, removed grizzly bears from the Endangered Species Act list. Uh, we challenged that in court and in September 2018, that, that rule was vacated as well. So they were placed back on the endangered species list, which was Hugely important, um, you know, not only because they, they really need to recover um, more fully and in more places, but at the time, Idaho and Wyoming had also proposed trophy hunts for grizzly bears. Um, so we were able to get an injunction, a temporary restraining order in court to get those stopped while the judge was deciding on the case. Um, and thankfully, he vacated the rule. The, Federal government did appeal, and actually that appeal will be heard next Tuesday on May 5th. It'll be argued. So, and there's also been some efforts, um, not quite as um, complete as, you know, the efforts to remove grizzly bears in Yellowstone from the Endangered Species Act list, but we are 
hearing some rumblings from the federal government about trying to remove federal protections from areas around Glacier as well. Wow. So in addition to working to keep grizzlies protected under the Endangered Species Act, what other work is the center doing to help grizzly bears? Well, we've got a lot of work on grizzly bears. It's actually um, the focus of, of most of my work right now. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have some litigation to protect grizzly bears in their habitat. So for example, one case we have, which we're actually, um, will be filing the opening brief soon, is to um, update the recovery plan for grizzly bears. The recovery plan came out in 1993 um, it's extremely outdated. It's not really based on the best available science or current science. So we're trying to get that updated and also uh, requesting that the court order Fish and Wildlife Service to look at unoccupied areas that could support grizzly bears. So in 2014, we filed a petition to Fish and Wildlife Service asking them to look at whether grizzly bears could be reintroduced into other areas, you know, instead of just these small five isolated populations. So the map you see here um, is based on work of, of some scientists that shows where grizzly bears potentially could live, where there is suitable habitat for them. So some of those areas in green, um, for example, you know, we're looking at the Sierra Nevadas as a potential place. Um, the Uintas in Utah, the Grand Canyon. There are a lot of places where we believe grizzly bears could do well and thrive. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service in the past has committed to looking at those areas, um, but they haven't done so. So we filed a petition and we're now, that, that was denied and we're now challenging that in court, the denial of that petition. Um, in addition, we are fighting um, it's called the Bog Creek Road Project. So up in the Selkirks, which is that blue area at the top of in very northern Idaho on the border with Canada, um, just below the Canadian border, Customs and Border Patrol are proposing to reconstruct a, a very old um, road that really, you can't even see the road prism anymore because it's completely covered with, you know, brush and trees and um, is functioning as, as really important habitat for grizzly bears right now. They want to go in and, and construct a road there, apparently to stop all the people that are, um, you know, trying to sneak into the United States through the wilderness of Idaho. <laughs> um, so we are challenging that in court. We also have another um, case in the upper green, which is... Um, just northwest of Pinedale in Wyoming. And there the Fish and Wildlife Service has approved the killing of up to 72 grizzly bears, um, primarily to protect livestock grazing uh, at a subsidized rate on public lands there, which is also in really important grizzly bear habitat. Um, so we're challenging that as well. In, in the Cabinet Mountains, I'll just talk about a couple more, but in the Cabinet Mountains, um, the Cabinet Yak, that orange area at the top, we are challenging the construction of an industrial uh, copper and silver mine um, called the Rock Creek Mine, which is in really important grizzly bear habitat. And, you know, the, the grizzly bear population there is is not really that great. It's pretty small and the mine would really cut right into the heart of um, kind of the center of their habitat there. So the likelihood that grizzly bears would not be connecting, you know, even to each other within that recovery zone is likely if that moves forward. Um, and then also right on the border of Canada in the Cabinet Yaks we're fighting a, a logging project called the Black Ram Logging Project. Um, that would remove large swaths of forests where grizzly bears are currently living. So those are just a few of the cases that we're working on. We also do a lot. It's not litigation, but um, that's just kind of where I'm, my energy is focused right now. Wow, it sounds like you have your hands full of projects trying to help grizzly bears. 
what can people who aren't environmental attorneys to do? How can our members or just the average person help save grizzlies? Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing I always tell people is to sign up for our action alerts. Um, I think probably most of the people listening to this webinar already get our action alerts. Um, but, you know, encourage your like-minded friends that you think would be interested in the issues to sign up as well. Um, I feel like we're always sending out action alerts about how people can help grizzlies. So one example you can see in the slide here is um, Montana, in Montana, the governor has put together a grizzly bear advisory council. And the purpose of the council is to um, kind of provide recommendations to Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, which is the state wildlife agency as to how to manage bears now and also in the future should they lose federal protections under the Endangered Species Act. And so one of the questions they are asking the public to weigh in on is whether grizzly bears, if they lose, lose federal protections, should be hunted in Montana. Um, so we're asking people to, to go to the link. I think we provide it um, via email tomorrow as well. But and just voice your opinion. It can be a really simple message that just says, I oppose hunting of grizzly bears. You can personalize it, you know, if, if you're a hunter, um, but don't, you know, don't like trophy hunting. You can say something like that. We ask you to keep your comments civil, of course. Um, you know, swearing at the state agency doesn't really do a whole lot of good. Um, but, you know, those are just some of the ways we ask people to weigh in. So if you don't jot this link down right now, we'll send you an email tomorrow with this link and the follow-up to this webinar so that you can submit comments to Montana and ask them not to allow grizzly bear hunting. So Andrea, I know they're not freshwater mussels, but what do you love about grizzly bears? Well, um, you know, I did apply to work on freshwater mussels, but unfortunately <laughs> I've been stuck with grizzly bears and wolves. <laughs> um, no, I mean, they're, you know, they're really, charismatic. They're extremely intelligent creatures. Um, you know, they're family oriented. They raised their cubs for two years. Um, and, you know, they're really important to the ecosystem. They provide a lot of benefits. A lot of, you know, top predators really do provide benefits that people don't even realize, which I think Noah might talk about a little bit. But um, I just think they're, they're really cool and really important. Thanks, Andrea. So, Noah, what role do big carnivores play in safeguarding biodiversity? How does this fit into the extinction crisis that we're fighting? Well, top, top carnivores are actually really important to biodiversity. You know, studies with wolves in um, Yellowstone found that after reintroduction, um, because of the reduction in numbers of elk um, and because elk potentially because elk moved more. Um, there was recovery of streamside vegetation, recovery of fish populations. Wolves also controlled coyote populations, which led to more foxes and thus more antelope. Um, so it's, you know, top predators really have a big effect on ecosystems. And bears are similar to wolves in that they, they regulate prey populations, they regulate elk populations. But they also do some things that wolves don't do. Um, they're really the most omnivorous of the carnivores, grizzly bears. They eat a lot of plants. They eat um, a lot of insects, army cutworm moss. Maybe Andrea mentioned those are one of their important food sources in um, Yellowstone. So they, they end up spreading a lot of seeds. And there are studies showing that um, grizzly bears increase plant diversity. So, you know, really the the North American landscape was shaped by these top predators. You know, scientists estimate there were as many as 2 million wolves in North America prior to European colonization and 50,000 grizzly bears. And um, that really had tremendous effect on all other species and on the landscape as a whole. Wow. So. That's grizzly bears. I realized getting ready for this webinar, I don't know very much about wolverines at all. Where do they live and what do they eat and why are they threatened? Yeah, so wolverines 
are um, truly a creature of the north. And here's a picture of them. They're, they're quite, quite handsome creatures as well. Um, they're a member of the weasel family, which is known as the Mustilidae. Truly one of my favorite uh, families of animals. There are 65 species around the world. Um, the wolverine is the biggest. Um, other ones are honey badgers. Maybe people remember the honey badger video that, that went viral a few years ago. Uh, mink, otter, um, fisher, martin. So just a really interesting and neat uh, family of animals. Um, let's see, can we have the slide? So wolverines, as I, are, as I said, are really a creature of the winter. You know, they select the really just the winteriest places you could possibly imagine. The top of mountains, you know, over 8,000 feet in elevation, north-facing aspects um, are preferred. And um, the reason for that is that they, you know, are just one, highly adapted to cold temperatures, but two, they raise their kits in snow dens. So they need really long, persistent snowpack in the spring to, um, to raise their kits. Here's a map of their historic range and their current range. You can see the historic range is the brown areas. That's where they've been lost from. Um, you know, for example, Michigan's team is the Wolverines, but there's, there's not Wolverines there anymore. Um, similarly, there's a grayling Michigan, but there's not grayling there anymore. And, you know, this, this distribution is, reflects the distribution of a lot of oriole species, nor, northern loving species, caribou, lynx, wolverine, um, many of which are endangered like the wolverine. Um, they used to occur in the, in the Oregon Cascades, no longer. They used to occur in the Sierra Nevada, no longer. Although, oh, three, four years ago, a wolverine actually made it all the way from Idaho down to the northern Sierra Nevada. So across, all the way across Oregon, um, across Northern California into the Sierra Nevada. And as far as I know, it's still alive. They've, every once in a while, there's a, you'll get caught on a trail cam, but it kind of shows you how feisty and tough these things are that they can just truck across, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles of terrain and end up somewhere where they used to occur. Wow, that's really cool. So what's threatening wolverines? So they were, wolverines were historically wiped out by um, fur trapping and, um, and also habitat destruction and then also um, the same predator control policies that Andrea mentioned. You know, the federal government actually used to drop poisons from airplanes to kill predators. So they were wiped out by that. You know, trapping has largely been banned now for wolverines, they still get incidentally captured sometimes. Um, and so they they were coming back, but now the real threat is climate change. As I said, they really need that, that spring snowpack, long lasting spring snowpack to raise their kits. And um, snow, snow is disappearing earlier and earlier in the year in the lower 48. And, and as the snow disappears, so too do the wolverines. So what's the center doing to help wolverines? So the center has actually been working to protect wolverines under the Endangered Species Act since the 1990s. And um, we had convinced the Fish and Wildlife Service under the Obama administration that they, they should be listed and they were actually proposed. And then um, Idaho and Montana in particular really objected to them being listed and um, put political pressure to bear. And uh, they, the Fish and Wildlife Service withdrew the proposal. We challenged that in court in Missoula in front of Judge Christensen, who actually has seen a couple Wolverines and um, were successful. So they're, they're actually um, scheduled for a new decision in um, June of 2021. And um, we're really hoping they're going to get the protection they so badly need this time. 
So why did the, did the states not want them to be protected? You know, it's, it's a, a couple things. At the time, Montana actually had a, a trapping, you know, they had limited permits for trapping wolverines. And um, I think they see it as, I think it's mainly about fur trapping. They see it as a threat to other trapping for other animals like bobcats, that there'll be more restrictions on trapping. Um, I, I guess I also met, forgot to mention, of course, that they're threatened by winter recreation. And there's increasing evidence of this, that snowmobiling, um, even backcountry skiing, which I'm a big fan of, um, can impact upon wolverines. But certainly things like ski area development and roads and people further and further into the backcountry is just a threat to wolverines. So I imagine they, they saw it as a threat to some of those activities as well. So what can our members do to help save wolverines? Well, as I said, Fish and Wildlife Service is considering listing wolverines under the Endangered Species Act right now. If you go to our webpage, we have an active alert um, related to that. So you can, you can um, click on that and send a message to the Fish and Wildlife Service telling them that you support listing these, these magnificent animals. So what do you love about wolverines and have you ever seen one? I actually have not been lucky enough to see one, although not for lack of trying. Um, as I said, I'm a backcountry skier, and so I've often hoped that I would see one when back in the mountains on my skis, but, but not yet. And, you know, people can actually go, you know, even people who research them can go years without actually seeing one. They're very you know, they occur in these pretty remote areas and are, are pretty elusive. Um, you know, I, I love weasels and I, I love wolverines in particular, you know, they're just a, they're really a symbol of toughness and really a symbol of winter. And I, I, I just um, admire their feistiness. They even get grizzly bears to back down. Uh, wow. so they're known to, known to push grizzly bears off of carcasses. So why is it taking so long to get them protected under the Endangered Species Act? You know, that's unfortunately how the Endangered Species Act has been working um, in recent decades, and particularly under Republican administrations, the Trump administration, the Bush administration before, you know, that just politics gets in the way and listing takes way too long. Of species that are listed right now, on average, it took 12 years for those species to get listed, um, even though the statute says it's a process that's supposed to take a bit over two years. So it's just, it really just comes to politics. You know, politics gets in the way of providing protections to, to our wildlife that just so badly need it. All right, well, thank you for that, Noah and Andrea. And now we're gonna take your questions and we have lots of time for questions today. And that's good because questions are already pouring in. Um, if we don't get to your question today, because there's already a huge number of them, you can chat with me tomorrow on Slack from 12 to 1 Pacific in the Endangered Species channel. Um, so lots of questions pouring in. Here's one for Andrea. Andrea, do you have recommendations for people to stay safe when hiking in areas with grizzly bears? Oh, I do, because um, I do it very often around here. Um, you know, the first thing is you always want to carry bear spray and make sure it is accessible. Um, you know, don't put it in your backpack because that's not gonna help you if you're hiking in a and you run into a grizzly bear, make sure you can pull it out pretty quickly and know how to use it. Um, it's always recommended around here that you hike in groups of four or more people. Um, you're just less likely to surprise a grizzly bear when you're in a group rather than hiking on your own. Um, and you want to make sure that when you are hiking, you're, you're making noise so you don't startle a grizzly bear. You know, the grizzly bears are not overly aggressive, they really want nothing to do with you. Um, but you know, if you do stumble upon a, a grizzly bear sow with cubs, she's, her instinct is gonna be to protect those cubs. 
Um, so that's really when, when people kind of find themselves in trouble with grizzly bears. But, you know, if you follow the recommendations, have bear spray, um, make noise, don't be walking through the woods um, completely silent, then I think it's pretty safe. There's a lot of questions coming in about climate. Um, if climate is the main threat to wolverines, how will Endangered Species Act protection help? That's a great question um, in a couple ways. I mean, one, you know, we've always taken the position that the Endangered Species Act does apply to emissions, you know, that federal agencies are required to ensure that their actions don't jeopardize listed species. and we haven't won on this issue yet, but we will soon that if, you know, the federal, if the federal government's permitting, you know, a, a large source of emissions, a, a new coal plant or offshore oil drilling or something like that, they should have to consult and ensure that doesn't jeopardize species threatened by climate change. Another thing it'll do is that if, you know, wolverines are going to have a chance you know, if they're going to survive in those places that still have remain enough snow for them to survive, we have to ensure that those places are protected from other threats like ski areas or roads or, or other winter recreation development. So it, it, it gives us the opportunity to protect them as best we can and give them a fighting chance. But also it's, it's important to recognize what's at stake with climate change. You know, and the wolverine, um, because it is such a charismatic animal, provides, you know, another example of what we're at risk of losing. Um, and also because it's associated with spring snowpack, you know, it, it highlights the fact that we're going to lose our, our snowpack earlier in the year, which has consequences for many other species. Um, salmon, for example, or other stream-dwelling animals that depend on, on cold, uh, clear streams, you know, are, are, are going to be in trouble if there's less snowpack because that's what keeps cold, clear, cold flowing streams in the mountains and in the valleys. So it's, it's really important to highlight what's at stake and the wolverine is a good way of doing that. What about grizzly bears? Here's a question about grizzlies and climate change. What role does climate change play in grizzly bear recovery? Um, it plays a little bit of a role for sure. I mean, some of the um, food sources that I was talking about are, are threatened by climate change. So white bark pine trees, for example, um, they were largely wiped out from um, beetle kill and the white bark, white bark pine beetles actually, as a result of climate change, were able to live longer. Um, and they, they really destroy those trees. And, and typically if you have a freeze of, um, I think it's two weeks or more, that will generally kill the beetles. Um, so even though it's a natural cycle of the forest, it's really been exacerbated um, by climate change and that has really affected the white bark pine food source for grizzly bears that were relying on those seeds and the uh, high caloric content of those seeds before denning. Um, so it definitely plays a role. No, it looks like grizzly bears are more popular than wolverines in terms of the question. So Andrew, you're <laughs> gonna be busy. <laughs> All right, I'm ready. <laughs> What areas have the greatest political support for reintroduction and are you focusing on those areas in particular? You know, we haven't done a lot in terms of seeking political support for the idea yet. We, we first need to get Fish and Wildlife Service on board with, um, you know, supporting the idea of at least, you know, looking at these areas and, and you know, making sure there is suitable habitat. Noah, you've done a little work in California, you and Jeff on- Yeah, uh, so, um, well, so the place where it has the most momentum right now is in the North Cascades. You know, there's, there's, an, there's a process to bring bears back there and, and um, hopefully that will, it seems a little stalled right now, but hopefully it will go forward. But when we filed, 
the recovery plan petition back in 2011 and identified additional areas where we thought recovery could happen, you know, we, we definitely got the most response from California, um, you know, and, and even, you know, years later, I'll still get calls from reporters who want to talk about the idea of bringing bears back to the Sierra Nevada. And, um, you know, it's, it's on the flag, you know, and the, the flag in California is just so iconic, you know, and I, I think a lot of people actually don't even really realize that the bear that's, you know, the state symbol is a grizzly bear and that the grizzly bear is extinct in California. Um, so we've really tried to highlight that. We actually um, worked with an ad guy to develop these really funny videos of different people, ones like a yoga teacher, one's a real estate developer um, who want to replace the bear on the flag. And they're, they're funny videos. They're, if you go to my Twitter um, feed, I have it locked there so you can see it. But I, I think of anywhere, you know, that where, you know, it's, it's possible to talk about grizzly bear reintroduction. I think the Sierra Nevada is most likely to get support. And as far as the North Cascades um, in Washington, I try to not call it a reintroduction effort. I'm hoping that there's still a few bears there. Um, but that process, you know, it, it's been slow, but it is moving forward. So the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service are both seemingly on board with um, augmenting the population. So bringing grizzly bears from elsewhere, um, you know, back into the North Cascades so they can repopulate that area. It's going through um, an environmental process under the National Environmental Policy Act. And I, I wanna say the first environmental analysis came out, maybe it was 2016 or 2017, and then they kind of sat on it. Um, and we didn't see any action for several years. And then last year, they actually re-released the same environmental analysis to collect more public comments on it. Um, so we're hoping that that actually is going somewhere fairly soon. So a question that uh, people keep asking, what are the current population numbers for both of these species? Um, for grizzly bears, we're looking at um, around 2,000 grizzly bears in the lower 48 states. Um, so there's about 700 in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. I think about 12, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. Um, and under 100 bears in the Selkirks and under 100 in the Cabinet Yak. And then for wolverines, there's not great um, data on it, but the thought is, is that there's fewer than 300 in the lower 48. So very fragile population size. So there's a, we talked about the North Cascades a lot already. There's a specific question about it though. Why are grizzlies having trouble populating the North Cascades? Is that known? Yeah, I mean, they're, they were there and I want to say Maybe even 10 or 15 years ago, I think there were about 10 grizzly bears left there. I think um, maybe two left as of five years ago. Um, it's, it's a lot of habitat destruction. Um, there's some livestock grazing there, but not a ton. Um, but they've just kind of been pushed out of the area. And I think there is a lot of suitable habitat and I think they have trouble connecting with grizzly bears in Canada. Um, Sabra, I know you know a little bit more about that, but. Yeah, I feel like it's a lot about what's happening in BC, you know, yeah. with the source population and, and getting cut off from those bears. And, and um, you know, yeah, I, th I think that's, that's what's driving that a lot is they were just a really small population and then they lost their source. Yeah, so I mean, they still have a fair amount of habitat protected in the North Cascades, but just just over the border in Canada, a lot of the habitat there has been crushed by logging and roads and um, other activities. So breaking that connectivity corridor, um, I think, has been really problematic. And, you know, the BC 
grizzly bear population is uh, fairly healthy. It's it's a you know definitely doing a little bit better now that they've banned trophy hunting up in that area. Um, but it, if they can't reach the North Cascades, I think that's the biggest problem. So in terms of wolverine recovery, has there been any effort made on a wolverine conservation or recovery strategy or any captive breeding programs? No, I mean, really just all that's been happening is some monitoring, you know, camera traps um, in, in the North Cascades and in the Northern Rockies. Um, and then um, some studies of winter recreation that are ongoing. Um, and, you know, have started to show that there are some impacts. So at this point, it's just been monitoring and research and not recovery effort up until this point. Here's a question for both of you. Is lead poisoning an issue for grizzly bears or wolverines if they feed on carcasses? Yes. If <laughs> um, Grizzly bears eat a lot of carrion, especially in the spring when they emerge from their dens. They're often um, you know, eating uh, carrion that's winter killed species. Most of those are not shot. They're, they're species that died, you know, as a result of the winter. Um, but in the fall, grizzly bears are, are definitely feeding on gut piles left by elk hunters and deer hunters. And so when lead is used, um, you know, it can definitely pose a threat. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I don't know if it's been, you know, documented as a big problem, but I, you know, certainly wolverines eat carrion as well, and I could see that being an issue. Um, are there any binational recovery efforts with Canada and or Mexico for both of these species? Not really. Um, you know, for for grizzly bears, they're, they're just not even close to Mexico right now. Um, they're just really confined to the Northern Rockies and um, the North Cascades that we talked about. Um, so I don't see them getting anywhere near Mexico anytime soon. Um, you know, there's, I think there has been talk between Fish and Wildlife Service in Canada a little bit about grizzly bears, but really, um, the recovery plans are separate. The Selkirk recovery zone actually does extend into Canada. Um, all the other recovery zones that Fish and Wildlife Service focuses on stop at the Canadian border, but the Selkirk population, actually, that recovery zone that's been designated extends into Canada, and it's part of the reason we're fighting that Bog Creek Road project, because Fish and Wildlife Service recognized when they designated that recovery zone that it was extremely important to keep connectivity between bears in Canada and, and bears in northern Idaho. And they're now seemingly taking on projects that, um, you know, is just going to thwart that connectivity. There's a specific question about that. Are you working on corridor projects to connect the areas where grizzlies and wolverines live? Yeah, I mean, it's mostly trying to protect, um, you know, the habitats where there are corridors. A lot of the connectivity corridors for grizzly bears, um, you know, if, if you look at like between the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem and the Northern Continental, Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, a lot of those lands are private. Um, but there are connectivity corridors, for example, between Greater Yellowstone ecosystem and, and the Selway Bitterroot, which is also another designated recovery zone where actually no grizzly bears live right now. There's been a few grizzly bears that have made their way there um, over the past 10 years, but there's really no population there. So we're mostly trying to, you know, protect the habitat and also work with the state agencies so that they're letting bears um, connect. So, you know, for example, Montana, there was a grizzly bear making its way. It was really, really close to the Selway Bitterroot and everybody was all excited and Montana went in and, you know, trapped the bear and relocated it back further out east. So the bear never made it to the Selway Bitterroot. So there's a little bit of work with 
state agencies as well, trying to, you know, get those areas protected and, and let grizzly bears actually, you know, get to these other areas where they could, you know, thrive and do well. There's a lot of questions coming in about ranchers. Are there any ranchers that support your efforts? Why don't conservation groups buy out problematic ranchers? Is there a policy to supply ranchers with dogs or non-lethal methods to protect their livestock from predators? Yeah, well, so the livestock industry is definitely um, somewhat challenging for grizzly bears. There are definitely um, some supportive ranchers that will implement non-lethal methods, you know, they'll um, have lights up or they'll pen their sheep. Um, they've got range riders on the landscape kind of watching for predators. Um, so there are some supportive ranchers. Um, unfortunately, there's some obstinate ranchers as well, um, you know, and, and they don't work with us as closely. We can't, we can't buy out problematic ranchers unless they are willing to do so. Um, they have to actually volunteer to be able to, um, you know, for us to be able to buy them out or other organizations that have worked on that as well. So there has been, also, oh, sorry, I, there I was just, I was just going to say for um, sheep, the primary conservation area that was first designated um, for Yellowstone grizzly bears, there were 10 sheep allotments, I think, and nine out of 10 were, were closed and bought out. And the, you know, the permittees were willing to do that. There's still one in Idaho who refuses, so. Go well, ahead. It takes legislation in order to, to have buyouts because, you know, these allotments, they're public lands allotments and um, under, under the authorizing legislation for national forests and BLM, they can rest allotments for 10 years, but they often can't completely close them absent some sort of legislation. Um, so that, that's been a real barrier to doing that more. Um, maybe when we get a new administration, there'll be more progress on those kinds of things. That's actually a question that's popping up. What happens if the Trump administration gets booted and what could happen under a new administration? Go ahead, Noah. <laughs> I mean, hopefully we, you know, see wolverines get listed. We see, you know, more ambitious recovery plan for grizzly bears that sees them in more areas. Um, I was going to mention, I actually, I, I had the fortune to spend a little bit of time with a Mexican activist named um, Oscar Moctezuma, who had a group, I think he's retired now, called Naturalia. And um, they... One of the things he was really inspired by was trying to get grizzly bears back into the Sierra Madre, and, and um, you know, so so maybe even we could see things like that bears in Arizona, and New Mexico, and maybe even in Mexico someday. You know, I, it's hard to picture you know something more affirming of the wild and of nature than bringing grizzly bears back to an area. And um, it's something that's possible. You know, Europe actually has been making tremendous progress on this. You know, brown bears in Europe are the same species. They're grizzly bears and they're in France now, they're in Spain. Um, and they've, they've been moving them around and putting them in new areas, um, Austria. So it's something that could happen if we had a more forward thinking uh, administration. There's a specific question about that. If bears are reintroduced to new areas, how do we ensure that they're actually protected and not classified under a 10J rule? You're probably gonna need to explain the 10J rule concept yeah, too, but um, how do we make sure they're protected? Right, so, you know, part of the reason, for example, that we've been kind of letting bears um, repopulate the cellulite <laughs> bear root on their own is to avoid, um, a 10J designation. So um, to explain what that is a little bit, under the Endangered Species Act, under the 10J provision, if a species is reintroduced to an area that it doesn't currently occupy, um, then those that 10J rule can often come with a lot of 
don't know what the right word is, but provisions that um, are not as protective as, you know, full Endangered Species Act protections. Um, so a lot of times you'll see a provision that says grizzly bears can be killed for certain purposes. Um, they don't receive the same um, protections in forms of, of if, you know, you do kill a grizzly bear. Um, unfortunately, if we did reintroduce grizzly bears to a place like California or Arizona or New Mexico, I think it would be hard to avoid that 10J designation. I think, um, you know, what would really be fighting for is for them to be designated an essential population as opposed to non-essential. So they're a little bit more protected and um, just try to make sure that 10J rule doesn't come with a lot of bad language. There's a question about that. that at all, Noah? Yeah, no, do you want to say something more about that? No, that, that covers it, I think. There's a question about um, will hunters face a fine or penalty for killing grizzly bears? Um, so, sorry, or? the question was, will hunters they be fine if they kill a grizzly bear? Yeah. Um, theoretically, yes. I mean, you know, there's certain provisions under the Fish and Wildlife Service's, you know, ESA and their policies that say that um, if a hunter accidentally kills a grizzly bear, um, mistaking it for a black bear, that they can be punished. So that's in theory. I think um, in reality, it's extremely rare. Um, I've seen it happen a few times. You know, there was a guy recently who shot a sow and cubs in his backyard and, you know, there was really no justification. You can't say that's, you know, self-defense or in defense of life because he was basically shooting from his back porch. Um, and he got fined, and I think he might have went to jail for a little while as well. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's just different based on how far Fish and Wildlife Service and the state agencies want to go in terms of punishing people, and it kind of varies. There's a specific question. I've never heard of this, the Yellowstone to Yukon Initiative for Grizzlies. Are you guys familiar with that? Why do I? Yeah, I think it's for more than grizzlies though, right? It's, you know, this idea of trying to create corridors for wildlife going all the way from Yellowstone to the Yukon. And there's a group that's focused on that and seem to do good stuff. Mm -hmm. Here's a philosophical question. It seems like the battle to save predators is an uphill battle. Is there hope? We could ask this about all of the center's campaigns. <laughs> I mean, I think there's hope, otherwise I, I wouldn't be doing this work. Um, but it, yeah, it's definitely an uphill battle. A lot of um, predator protection is, is really highly politicized. Um, so it seems like we're, you know, fighting politics and politicians a lot more than I would like to be doing, um, especially with grizzly bears. I mean, the states are so um, adamant about getting them off the endangered species list so they can manage them on their own and we've already seen what's going to happen. They're going to open trophy hunts if they get the management so we've got to try to keep it out of state hands um, for now at least. Um, but yeah, there's it's an uphill battle but I'd say there's hope. What do you think, Noah? Well, we've gone from, you know, a, a situation where the government was actively trying to remove all predators from the landscape, you know, for decades, from roughly, you know, the 30s to the 60s, you know, and, and um, so we've, you know, with passage of the Endangered Species Act, we've, we've moved away from that. And I think, you know, the understanding of ecology among people is just a lot greater and people realize these things are important and so I, I think we've made a lot of progress although it, it feels slow at times and you know I wish there were wolves and bears and a lot more places than there are but, but we're making progress. We've only got time for a couple more questions but we'll try to squeeze a few more in. Um, Wolverines, are there wolverines in Mount Rainier, and is it true that the Midwest was part of their former range? 
Um, it is true that the Midwest is part of their former range. Um, I was actually just looking at the research on this on trying to ascertain their former range because it's been a long time since there was a wolverine in Minnesota, uh, like turn of the turn of the century, um, last century. Um, and then in Washington, they're in the North Cascades, and um, there's been one that's gotten all the way down to the Gifford Pinchot. I believe so they they should be around Mount Rainier as well but I, I think that the primary place where you're likely to see one would be North Cascades and um, you know maybe one traveling through at Mount Rainier. Here's a actually where I am I just saw on the news um, I just saw on the news yesterday or two days ago that there was a wolverine spotted on the west slope of the Tetons which is yeah, yeah I saw that too. Much my backyard so I need yeah. to try to find it. <laughs> We're going to take one more question. Um, is there a critical population size for both species to ensure long-term genetic viability? I think for grizzly bears, at least, we haven't been really focused on, you know, what the population size should be as opposed to, you know, trying to connect those recovery areas that we talked about so that they're not in these isolated populations, but I hate to say, you know, once we have 3,000 grizzly bears, we're in great shape. I, I think it's more, I don't know, we see recovery, I think, as just a bigger picture goal. No, what about wolverines? Well, so scientists use this rule of thumb where they say an effective population size of 500 is typically considered secure from a genetics perspective. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, wolverines are clearly, an effective population size means that's like the number of breeding pairs. Um, so usually to have 500, you need a couple thousand. Um, and so wolverines, especially since they're pretty solitary and they spread out, you know, with with 300 spread out across their range in the lower 48, it's really, they're not secure at that, at that population size um, genetically or just from extinction. Well, thank you both for all the information you shared with us today and for teaching us about these exciting animals. Sorry that we didn't get to all the questions. If you have questions that you want answered that we didn't get to, you can send me an email or I'll be on Slack tomorrow in the Mobilize for the Wild Endangered Species channel from 12 to 1 Pacific. And I'll be there every Friday at 12 Pacific. Tomorrow, you'll get an email from us with an action alert to write Montana to ask them not to hunt grizzly bears. And if you want to take action to ask the Fish and Wildlife Service to protect wolverines, you can go to our website under action, current action alerts and go to wildlife and you'll see the wolverine alert and you can use our form to submit a letter to the Fish and Wildlife Service asking them to protect wolverines under the Endangered Species Act. Next week's webinar is going to be on Wednesday at four. It's with Mobilize for the Wild and it's in preparation for Endangered Species Day. Endangered Species Day is May 15th and we know that you guys are passionate about defending endangered species and you all that you've had. So next week's webinar will be about turning those stories into action to help save the Endangered Species Act. It's Wednesday at four. And then the week after that, on May 14th, we're back on Thursday. And we're going to talk about wolves in the West with two of our staff members who work on protection for wolves. So thank you so much for joining us today. And I will see you next Wednesday and then the following Thursday to talk about wolves. Take care.